2023 was supposed to be the year that the U.S. economy heads into a recession. At the start of the year, the Wall Street consensus forecast was that there was a 65% chance the U.S. economy would be in a recession in just 12 months. Even as of last week, the recession probability model of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York was still suggesting that the odds of a U.S. recession were at the highest level in decades. Yet, over the past two weeks, a string of stronger-than-expected data has called into question the recession thesis by showing that the economy was regaining momentum at the start of the year. The January U.S. job data shows the economy creating 500,000 jobs, double the pace of December. Meanwhile, retail sales grew a whopping 3% in January, after a 1% contraction in December. The ISM Services Index jumped from 45 in December to 60 in January, the highest level in six months. What is going on? Is this a resurrection of the dead or a surge before death? Why haven't the interest rate increases by the Federal Reserve over the past year, the most aggressive in decades, done the U.S. economy in? What does it tell us about the U.S. economy? What does it mean for investors and your money? Hi, I'm David Wu, a former Wall Street strategist with a 20-year track record of making actionable predictions about major global change. Welcome to The Money Game, where I take on groupthink, propaganda, and conspiracy theories in my critical analysis of markets, economics, and politics. Before we begin, please hit subscribe and the bell button so that you'll be notified when a new video comes out. Some of you might remember one of my videos from two months ago, in which I explained why I thought Wall Street was getting ahead of itself pricing a 2023 U.S. recession. I'm glad that so far my skepticism has been vindicated. Over the past two weeks, the bond market has pushed up the so-called terminal Fed funds rate, the peak level of interest rates in the Fed tightening cycle, to 5.2%, the highest level since the Fed started raising interest rates last year. Equally importantly, the market has reduced its expectation of Fed rate cuts this year from 40 basis points to just now 20 basis points. And yet, this has not stopped some well-informed and very well-paid people on Wall Street to double down on their recession call. For example, on Monday, J.P. Morgan, the biggest bank in the world, said that the bank is turning more defensive on stocks and recommended its clients to move to the sideline of the stock market because a recession is currently not priced into equity markets, they said. What is it that the recession camp sees in the tea leaves? Well, history tells us the Fed's tightening cycle almost always leads to a recession. Given short-term interest rates have risen to their highest level in more than 10 years, it is understandable why so many people think a recession is just around the corner. But what is it about high interest rates that causes recessions in the first place? One crucial reason is that higher interest rates tend to reduce the availability of credit and loans. Credit and loans are like oxygen to the modern economy. When banks tighten their lending standards, it chokes the economy. The Senior Loans Officer survey conducted by the Fed shows that when lending standards tighten, a recession usually follows. Over the past year, lending standards for commercial industrial loans have been tightening. As of the end of last year, the number of loan officers reporting tightening reached levels that in the past 30 years have been associated with recessions. The same is true about credit card loans, by the way. Yet credit card loans continue to grow. Indeed, last week, outstanding credit card loans hit $950 billion, the highest ever. Why is this happening? Should we be concerned? A key fact to consider is that even with borrowing rates on credit cards now at 20%, delinquency rate remains very low. This means consumers remain capable of servicing and repaying their debt. Is this that surprising? After all, the single most important determinant of the ability of anyone to repay debt is gainful employment. With the unemployment rate at its all-time low, and with twice as many vacancies as there are job seekers. Anyone who wants to work or needs to work is working or can easily find a job. Moreover, the Biden administration's student loan forgiveness program is probably also boosting demand for credit card loans. 
even though the bill for broad student debt cancellation is still pending review by the Supreme Court. A whole host of related initiatives are making it much easier for people to walk away from their student debt. The latest University of Michigan U.S. Consumer Survey shows that current assessment of personal finances surged 16% to its highest reading in eight months. Meanwhile, there are even signs that people who left the labor force during the lockdowns are starting to return. The labor force increased by 870,000 in January after an already strong increase of 440,000 in December. If this continues, it will mean even more people working and more people spending. All of the above explains why higher interest rates are so far having so little impact on U.S. consumer spending, which accounts for 70% of U.S. GDP. If consumption is not affected by higher interest rates, what about investments? What about capital expenditure spending and housing-related investments? Shouldn't higher interest rates make borrowing and investing in equipment by companies and investing in new homes more expensive? Whatever the reason may be, new orders of non-defense capital goods, excluding aircraft, which are otherwise known as core capital goods, remain near the cycle high, even if they're no longer going up. I suspect there are two reasons for this. One, in an earlier video, I talked about the reshoring of jobs back to the U.S., especially from China. I talked about how this was exacerbating an already tight U.S. labor market. But reshoring also requires a lot of investments, like new plants and new equipment. I think reshoring is an important reason for why corporate investments have not buckled under high interest rates. Two, capitalist economies are driven by what economists call created destruction. Innovation and competition destroy old businesses while creating new ones. One of the most remarkable aspects of the U.S. economy over the past three years has been a surge in a number of business formations that in January reached 420,000. This is lower than the peak in 2020, but it is 30% above the pre-pandemic level. The implied increase in business opportunities in the U.S. as the result of changing lifestyles and spending habits is probably also helping to keep capital spending at a very high level. Higher interest rates have driven mortgage rates to decade highs, which in turn have driven down home sales. An estimated 644,000 new homes were sold in 2022, 16% below 2021. But new home sales have been picking up since September when mortgage rates peaked. Housing starts for single-family units after having dropped 30% last year are stabilizing. This is presumably because the building starts were not high to begin with and this needed to fall less. At just 900,000 annualized rate, it is barely half of the current rate of household formation in the United States. The bottom line, higher interest rates have had a more limited impact on fixed capital investment than in past interest rate hiking cycles. Over the past four months, we've seen a massive easing of financial conditions. Indeed, financial conditions, the transmission mechanism for modern monetary policy, has loosened so much that it's as though the Fed never hiked rates. The main reason behind the easing of financial conditions is the belief in the market that a recession will be coming soon, which will force the Fed to cut interest rates. Ironically, the easing of financial conditions has reduced the probability of the economy going into a recession. As a result, financial conditions will have to tighten. This means interest rates in the dollar will have to go up, credit spreads will have to widen, and stocks will have to fall. The urgency for tighter financial conditions has risen on the back of the January consumer price inflation data that shows the pace of this inflation is slow. On a year-on-year -year basis, CPI inflation fell only slightly from 6.5 to 6.4%, far above the Fed's 2% target. Meanwhile, core services inflation, which accounts for more than 70% of core inflation, grew 0.6% on a month, unchanged from last month. 
The fact that core services inflation, a key focus for the Fed, remains high and that rising energy prices are slowing the descent of the actual headline inflation should make the Fed very nervous. Over the past two weeks, bond yields have gone up and the market has become more aligned with the Fed in terms of the expectation of short-term interest rate outlook. However, the Fed's outlook is based on the data available in the middle of December. Things have changed a lot since, with both growth and inflation stronger than expected. I would be very surprised if the Fed Chair Jerome Powell thinks that with 10-year Treasury yields at 3.8% and S&P 500 north of 4,000, the Fed even has a fighting chance to bring inflation down to 2% anytime soon. Indeed, the bond market's forecast of consumer price inflation one year from now has gone from just below 2% at the start of the year to now 2.9% this week. The Fed knows that the longer inflation stays above 2%, the more difficult and more costly it will be to bring it down later. This is why I think the Fed will have to either send a stronger message to the market or put their money where their mouth is. Whatever they do, I suspect that bond sell-off is not over and that the equity rally definitely is. The stock market is treating strong economic data as good news so far. This won't last too long. That much, I'm fairly sure. If you got something out of this program, I would appreciate you hit like. If you got something out of this program, please hit like and subscribe to my free YouTube channel. If you want to learn more about my investment strategy, come visit us at davidwuunbound.com. Thank you for listening.